I'm afraid to throw it because you can't okay, catch. We're starting. <laughs> All right. There's so what's up, one. man? How you doing? I'm good. What's up, brother? Mm, not much. So I want to say a couple things before we actually get into this. I will want right. to say that the, the the podcast has changed. So the image you're seeing is different, and it's something that I absolutely know nothing about. And I have to give a shout out to Ricky Masco for staying up last night and helping me with all this stuff because we wouldn't be able to do it without him. So shout out to Ricky Masco. He's the guy that's doing the live streaming this weekend, which is going to be the big topic that we are talking about tonight uh, with our friend Danny Spink. So how you doing, Danny? Doing all right? I'm good, brother. What's up? Are you excited? How's life? That's uh, okay. Are you excited for this weekend? <laughs> it's okay. I'm dude. I'm really pumped. We're uh, we had a tournament at Concord this past weekend, the, um, the Baker Trio thing. And uh, it was fun talking to everybody, how excited everybody was about it. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's so funny because everybody's got, like, different things that they're excited about. And so it's really fun to talk to. You know, you talk to one person, it's really all about the bowling. And some people are like, oh, I mean, I can't wait to see what happens with the Calcutta. You know, the gamblers of the groups. Oh, I forgot about the Calcutta. When does that start? Starts at 9. Okay. So, so Calcutta starts, starts at, at 9. nine. And then the actual tournament starts at 10? Yeah, so bowlers check in at 8. Well, 8 to 9, really. I mean, it's up to them. Um, I just figured set it at 8, give them plenty of time. Then practice will start at 9. Uh, practice will run for an hour. All the bowlers will be practicing on one pair of lanes uh, for one hour while the Calcutta goes on. They get to throw any ball they want in practice. And then once practice is over, then they um, – decide what two bowling balls they want to use for competition. Um, but I figure that the reason I did the hour long practice, which a lot of people are like in you know, hours worth of practice seems like an awful lot, but uh, with the Calcutta going on, it'll give that way. We're not rushing anything. You know, the bowlers aren't like running all over the place to find bowling balls, to try different shots. You know, that way no one gets hurt. Everybody can get a shot in and it gives them a chance to see an hour's worth of transition on the pattern. Right. to get a better, more informed decision on what bowling ball they want to throw. Um, because, you know, for 10 games, they're going to throw the two bowling balls. And, you know, at 15 minutes on a pattern doesn't exactly show any of the transition. So an hour's worth of shots going down the lane constantly is going to give a really good idea of how that lane's pattern is going to break down. So for those of you who don't know what's going on this weekend, Danny's running – is it your first tournament you've ever ran? Uh, I, yeah, it's, it is my it is my first tournament. Um, I ran, well, I ran. It wasn't really a tournament; it was a nonprofit event that was kind of like a tournament. We gave a first prize prize and a last prize prize, and I made the trophies out of stuff from Goodwill. <laughs> so that was probably my first tournament. <laughs> okay. One was like one was the base of a kid's toilet. <laughs> That's crazy. That, that was the last place prize. <laughs> So this weekend, what is it, June 15th, Friday night, he's running a tournament, a different style of tournament. It's a $1,000 entry, and you bowl 10 games, and you pay out the top two spots each game. Right, exactly. Why'd you choose that format? Well, so me and uh, the guy that's running the tournament, Ricky, we work with uh, at a company called, we worked at a company called in situ form. He still works there uh, with Billy Locke and we would be working overnights together and you'd be sitting there doing your work, doing your work, doing your work. And your just mind is going a million miles an hour. So while I'm sitting there overnights, I'm sitting here like running tournament ideas through my head just because I'm obsessed with bowling and we can't stop. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> and, I'm, and basically it's just like thinking about things I would want to bowl. So like I ra I thought of like a marathon tournament style and I just, I remember being a kid and getting the, the fastest way I felt like I got better was bowling for jackpots. And at Lindenwood, when me and you were there, Brad, and like my freshman year, I guess it would have been your sophomore year, every Thursday night we bowled jackpots. It just was what we did. And yeah. that just doesn't really happen anymore. And if you do bowl jackpots, it's for like $5 here. And you can only get a guy to stay in for like maybe two or three games and then they're out. Now, let alone $20 a game, $30 a game, $40 a game. So I was thinking, like, if you want to run jackpots, you have to – I felt like I had to rebrand it, re-put it – you know, wrap it in a different packaging. Right. So I decided to call it a tournament, 
And really, all we're, all it is is ten games at a hundred dollars a game jackpots. Yeah, that's pretty much what it technically, is. It's technically what it is, but it's packaged differently. And you know, when you throw the live streaming into it, so and then uh, I was really fortunate too because I ran the idea by Brad, I ran the idea by Kyle, Tim Barrett, Shea Bittenbender. So I had four guys locked down before I released the event that I knew I could count on to bowl. And so when I released it, I already had four people signed up. And then it was like, kind of like when you have a party, you don't want to say, like, oh, who's at the party? Oh, uh, it's just me. Like, no one's going to show up. But you're like, oh, man, it's this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy's here. You totally should come. It's going to be awesome. So we kind of had that effect going. And then the first post I made, you know, we got the we got the haters who were like, oh, this is never going to work. And, oh, yeah. oh, I don't know what you're doing. And then the people, then the, the people who really loved it, like, were overwhelming and so we hit 12 really really quick 12 people that wanted to put up a thousand dollars bowl basically 10 games with the jackpots on something super super tough um and with limited bowling ball options which was really really cool and i'm just jealous i can't bowl since i'm running it yeah you mean you got some good players go through the list real quick of the 20 guys that you got Keep um, right. it's a good question here i got it right here one second so we have – I'm just going to go in order of what I have here. All right. So, yeah. So, first on the list, we got Timmy B, followed by your uh, your cohort and uh, podcast. So, we got Kyle Sherman. And then Jeremy Boyer was going to bowl, uh, had a work conflict. He can't compete anymore. Um, Andrew Orff, uh, part of the, the St. Louis Orff family, if you're from St. Louis or really, I mean – a lot of the country knows Ray Orff and Richie Orff. Richie Orff was really was successful on the regional tour. His dad, uh, you got Bruce Franks Jr. If a lot of bowlers probably don't know him, but he's actually a Missouri State representative. Um, one of like he's treated me like a big brother since I can remember. He's always had my back, um, and uh, you know he's a really really good guy. I, I really really like him a lot. Uh, you got Michael Holloman, who, dude, about a year ago. I had my doubts. I didn't know. I didn't really know him that well. I didn't know his success track, but he is just murdering it this year. Uh, Dude, just, he's incredible. Like I didn't ever, I didn't really get to see him that bowl that much. And then I think he came to St. Louis a couple times and just whacked him. And I didn't know if he was just another lefty coming into St. Louis and whacking it. And then uh, I've been watching it. He's, he's just the real deal. He's awesome. Um, you got Roy Adams, who is a local, I guess he, I don't know which way he lives. St. Illinois or St. Uh, St. Charles, but he's really, really good. He does like extremely well in the over 50 stuff, and he really, really keeps up um, and kicks butt. And the regular events, too, he's he's a tough competitor. Uh, I bowled a doubles tournament with him a little back, and he got first and then tied, uh, he got second with me, so he could enter multiple times. Uh, you got Derek Matson, who uh, is a lefty who just, just smacks on the ball. He signed with uh, EBI, EBI a little yeah. while ago. Yeah, which is a big – dude, he is so pumped about that. And he's deserving of it, man. He's He was winning stuff in St. Louis, just having an arsenal of two teal rhinos. Oh, yeah. So then he finally got, then he finally got an arsenal, and he's just – I think he, he won one of the local tournaments averaging 270 this year. Like, it was crazy. Uh, you got Mike Sapolis, who um, actually works at the center that we're running the tournament at, and he is a constant contender in everything in St. Louis. He's kind of like me. He doesn't uh, – Bowl a lot of stuff, but he he competes in everything he bowls in, and of course you got Shea Bit there, who is I don't think he's ever had a bad tournament in his life. I, I don't, don't think, think he has game. either, man. The guy doesn't quit. <laughs> like you're like, oh, don't worry, he'll he'll lose his look, and then you, he start. The worst part is you're bowling next to him, and you got the nuts, <laughs> and all of a sudden you're bowling, and he, he has the nuts, and all of a sudden you see him split like one or two times in the first three frames, and somehow. He runs the sheet to shoot 240 still. It, it just, I don't get it. I know. The second you think you have an in, you no longer have an in five minutes later. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's stupid. He makes a ball change and it just whacks it. And, of course, everybody knows EJ. You got EJ Tackett. Um, yeah, that's not, a big one. That's a good one. Dude, and, and what's so funny is so he's dating um, Natalie Natalie Goodman, who grew up in the St. Louis area, bowling the gateways and archways and everything with us. And, I don't know where EJ is originally from, but I know he's living pretty close to St. Louis now. So he's been bowling uh, a few things here and there. And then when I saw him at the uh, part-time bowlers tour tournament in Cape Girardeau, 
I was like, hey, what are you doing this weekend? We got this going on, showed him a flyer, and uh, didn't have anything going on. And he's like, dude, sign me up, let's go. Because I know he's, he's a big, pretty, pretty big money bowler. He, he loves bowling for money. Oh, he's just a, yeah, absolutely. Because he, he, uh, he was in town with uh, uh, Natalie for one of Larry Husky's events, right? And that's when you asked him? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, next person, got Stephen Jarvis, who bowled for McKendry. I think he bowled. I don't know. Was he on the same team as AJ? I can't um, remember. Stephen Jarvis. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he was on the team when they made the TV show. I don't. I can't remember who they bowled. Uh, was it Weber? Uh, I, I can't remember. I don't know. I can't remember. He's, he's really, really good. He bowls on the Illinois side out there at St. Clair. He, he works in the pro shop uh, that I'm on staff with, uh, the bowler shop uh, run by Mike Miniman. Um, oh, okay, out of Fairview. Yeah, he's, he's a good bowler. Uh, next was supposed to be Jerry, Jeremy Zimmerle. He won the spot through our sweeper, but decided to sell that spot to a, a, a little scruffy kid named Ryan Stubberfield, who is a, a local St. Charles bowler. I think uh, most people in St. Louis know him. He's did uh, he bowled for Linwood this year. Had a really really good year. Um, won a few. I'm pretty sure he won a few tournaments and uh, made a All American, a second team or first team All American. Bowled really really well. Um, and then you got Gene Perez. It's either Gene or John Perez, Jeans. but uh, he, it is Gene. Okay, good. That's what I thought. You got Gene Perez, who I would never met him, never seen him bowl before, but apparently he's really good. He's a stud. He's a stud. Yeah, I, I had, I've seen a few videos online, but I've, I had never bowled against him before. And then you're, you got yours truly, Mr. Baby Baby mm, Miller. Baby Miller. Uh, Bud Light lime drinking. So. <laughs> All right, side note. Have you had the Bud Light orange yet? I have not. Dude, it's so good. I actually haven't had a sip of alcohol in over a month. Oh, well, good for you. Clo- it's close to a month. Do you remember that time? Was it? Were you there at Swiss Trios? It was. I think it was Dean. Maybe it was Dean and RJ. But we finished half of our. Uh, we were re- we were really hung over, and we we're trying to bowl the Swiss and uh, in Wichita. And so we decided to pour uh, half half a gallon of orange juice in our pitchers of beer. It was so good. Hey, I was there. I was. I was. Right was that you? <laughs> yeah. Was it then? So then it was you on the team then. Yeah, it was, it me, was you me and RJ. I think it was. Me. Was that it? I don't think Dean was there. I bowled one year with Dean. I swear I bowled one year with Dean. Maybe it was me, Dean, and RJ one year. Huh. Cause it I, might I, have been you, Dean. I only bowled a couple years. Was it because I, I believe the last year I bowled, we we lost the la- we were in third and we lost that match against Tom Patton's team. Was that you? Yes. I remember bowling with you because I had the absolute world the first day with my urethane, and I came back the second day and I just threw it god awful. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. So, yep, it was definitely you. <laughs> yeah. Good old nope, Bud Light Orange. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then we got our next guy, Dave uh, David Rosenberg, who is, I think, from Springfield. He is uh, another another uh, long on the tooth guy. He's a lefty. Yeah, but he, if you ever see him bowl, he's one of those, uh, like, uh, how would you? He doesn't. He doesn't do a lot to the ball, but he, he just doesn't miss. Like he's super accurate. No, he's definitely a really good player. Dude, he's, it's just down and in, and it, he's gonna he's gonna be a tough to beat too. Like that's the cool thing I've been seeing about everybody. It's everybody's so different. It's gonna be fun. Oh. Uh, oh yeah, and then we got next up. Now I haven't met this guy yet. I'm super excited to meet him because he's he's like a high high like super high energy guy. But Matt Hardigan and his brother Tim Hardigan are both bowling. I don't they know who the, they are. Dude, go to his if you go to his page and check him out. Him and his brother went on like a huge bowling spree, like a dream trip type of thing, where they just committed all in to all these tournaments and then just went for it. And uh, luckily, our tournament's part of that, basically. Uh, but. He, uh, he, I saw a video. He was coaching. He coaches Little League for his, uh, I don't know if his kids or not, but he coaches Little League, and he's just a super high-energy guy. I'm excited to meet him. That's cool. So him and his brother, Tim? Tim, yeah. He said Tim. He's like, my brother's a big polar bear because we were. T- I was trying to get him a shirt size. He's like, whatever your biggest shirt is. I was like, all right, deal. Where are they from? Uh, Mississippi. It's wow. Missi- Mi- Mississippi versus the world. That's what he keeps saying. <laughs> 
That's pretty cool. That's that's crazy. I've never like met them or anything. No, he se- he seems like a really cool guy. I'm excited to meet him. Uh, you got 19th. You got Mr. Cameron Doyle, who was a late sign up. Actually, I just messaged him out of the blue when I was trying to fill the last two spots, and it took like for maybe three hours for him to be like, dude, hold the spot. I want a ball. Let me find out what's going on. Um, and then he uh, called me back and locked in the spot and would be paid within a week and had everything going for him. So it was pretty cool. And then uh, you got lat- 20th spot. You got Mr. Chris Aldridge, who was also a late addition. Now, Chris is a, a good buddy of mine. I grew up bowling with him in the St. Louis area. And uh, he... I swear shoots more three hundreds than anybody I know. And he does them like back to back. I don't I just don't understand it. Who? Chris Aldridge. I bowled league with him this Wednesday and I shot like three three hundreds in league, which for me is a decent amount. And I think he had like six and on top of that, that like three or four eight hundreds too. Like he struck a lot. He's been on he's been on a tear. And then I know he's got like three three hundreds already in summer league. Like, he just shoots 300s. He's bowling at Concord, isn't he? He's bowling, and he's bowling at Concord. He's probably, like, one of the nicest guys. Like, I've done so many things to make him mad, where it's like any normal person would have punched me in the face for that. And then, (laughs) like, he just lets it go. I was like, it's a good thing you're such a nice guy, because there's no way way you would tolerate me. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty cool that he's bowling. His uh, his brother Cody's trying to get in, too, right? Yeah, he's right now. Uh, so we have one spot left to fill. So you got Cody who's trying to get in. He's trying to sell <coughs> four shares for himself at 250. And I think he's at two. So he's, he still needs two more, which, man, I really, really want to see him get in because he is like a, he's a firecracker. He's going to stir up some trouble, man. And uh, I, he, he, uh, he's definitely a uh, showman. You know, he likes to. Oh get into it dude and he is he has nothing to lose like if you if you talk to him like he just doesn't care like he's there for himself and he knows him and he does his stuff he does his thing and he just goes he, for it he's gotten a lot better too a lot better i can remember when he first started bowling he he came he was just chris's little brother and i don't think he ever bowled i think he worked at st charles lanes there for a little while and then he just started like bowling because he was there and then now he's decent. He's pretty good. Oh, dude! From where he started, at least he's just got a good head for it. He gets he gets ahead of himself every once in a while. Gets a little well, sure. emotional into it, but I think we all get yeah. into that. I mean, I'm I'm still pretty emotional when I bowl. I mean, I definitely he's, the older I get, I feel like at this point I've bowled a lot of tournaments in my life. But the older I get, the the easier that becomes. But he really hasn't been bowling for very long. When I was bowling for that long, man, I was a head case and a half. Dude, I, I feel like it's so draining. Like, I feel myself about to get mad in a tournament. I go, I don't have the energy. <laughs> like, it's just like, I'm like, ah! and then it just like subsides just because I know how much it's going to take out of me. I'm like, I can't get through 10 games like this. Exactly. That's that's the thing. Like, if you bowl enough, you just realize like, okay, I've shot 160 before. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> like, it's going to happen. Next game. <laughs> And I'm gonna shoot 160 when I need 190 to make the cut. It's gonna happen. Like it's just another game. Move on. At least I'm getting better at that. When I first, when oh, yeah. I first, when I was in college and then graduated college, I wasn't very good at that at all. But now I'm getting a little better. Well, but on the same token, I saw uh, Steve Orff posted a thing about because Father John made a post the other day about St. Louis bowlers and needing to bowl in sport conditions more and things like that. And uh, Steve made a good post about it. Like people who bowl. Because when you were bowling in Linwood, you were also bowling on St. Louis house shots a lot. So our mentality was, I mean, if we didn't start with a four bagger and like, God forbid you ring a 10 pin in your second shot, you felt like your whole game just went to nothing. You you wanted to come out with a four bagger. Whereas like you're talking about the 160s, like when you're bowling on tough stuff all the time and you open two times in the first five frames on a transitional game. it's like, you're still mentally sharp enough since you've been bowling on that stuff all the time and you're prepared for it. Like you, you can dig deep and finish that game strong to still get back to something decent. Whereas if you bowl on easy stuff all the time, it's really easy to get discouraged when you come out with a couple opens in the first five frames and feel like your game's already gone because you just, you're not, you're not going through those mental struggles on a regular basis. So, 
it just seems so overwhelming in a tournament situation. Yeah, and, so that's that's the what the way I see it is when I'm really bowling good or when I'm really confident that no matter what I do, I'm confident that I'm going to end up in a good spot. So even if I shoot 151 game, as long as the scores aren't like super high scoring, then uh, then you're not out of it. And as long as you're not out of it. If you're bowling decent, then you're going to have the confidence to get there. But what I notice when I'm confident is I'm just focused on ball motion uh, the most. I don't really care about my score. So say I go 6-2, 6-1. Like if I'm in the zone and I'm putting the ball where I want to, then that doesn't matter because I know that whatever scenario I get in, um, at the end of the tournament, I'm going to be at least close or at least give myself a chance. Or even if things right. don't go my way, at least I'm putting the ball where I want to. That's important for me. Right. Well, and that's what I'm excited about too with this event. So it's 10 games. Is there a way to pull up the pattern so they can see it? Cause I sent it to you, but um, we can have, maybe we can just share it to. Nope. We can do it. Let's see. Let's work on this. I got to get better at this stuff anyway. Um, okay, so how do I find the pattern? Where am I going? It's, I sent it to you on a Facebook message. Okay. It's a PDF. Um. But while you're, while you're pulling it up, I'll basically explain it. So originally when I started the tournament, I was going to do a negative two to one ratio pattern. So that means reverse <laughs> block. Um, right. That makes so me when I say that. <laughs> yeah. So when I first started bowling on sport conditions, um, my mom was a Saint, uh, bowled here in St. Louis, and that was like the general definition of a sport pattern. Like, oh, that you, you're bowling on a reverse block. Just because when you missed right, there wasn't that bounce of friction, so everything seemed like a reverse block. And that was like what I thought a reverse block was. And then you learn what a reverse block really was. Well, I was going to put out a true reverse block and really just make it over exaggerated. And after talking to people smarter than I, <laughs> we uh, we came up with a better option. So when Brad does get it pulled up, you'll see what I mean. But this pattern is 39 feet and it is completely flat. There is no shape to the pattern at all. It is from two to two, completely flat. And I was looking at an old U.S. Open graph. Uh, I forget what year it is, but it's a sweeper that they're running at St. Charles. And they had a total of, I think it was nine, two to twos on the pattern. And then they were loaded, uh, like maybe I think there's some three to three, some four to four loads to be, give the pattern some shape to make them a little, a little more, I guess you could, I wouldn't say easier, but to give it some shape. This one has 15 two to twos across the board. <laughs> so, like, so it's about as hard as you can make it. About, like when you miss right, I mean, it is going to absolutely stay there. <laughs> Have you practiced on it yet? I actually, I was going to practice on it and I made the decision not to. Why? Well, the ma the major reason was when I go bowl on it, so I didn't know if I could put it out the way I wanted to put it out because I'm going to have Dan double strip the lanes when we put this pattern out because I don't want to have any house shots, um, I guess, memory. And then also just with my life schedule right now, it was, it really wasn't, I guess I could really, if I really wanted to make it happen, I could. It's just a lot going on right now. So, um, with the fact that John, the person who helped me make this pattern specifically was John Janowitz and like talk about going out of his way to help me out. I was in, you know, the 11th hour and, and I needed some help to get bailed out of a, a tough situation. And I just messaged him and I like maybe 30 minutes later, it wasn't just like a, like a, you know, a half ass message back. Like it was a full thought out paragraph of like questions and answers and trying to figure out exactly what I needed or where he could help me out. And we went back and forth, and he was on vacation. I think he's bowling the USPCs actually while it was going on, and he still got me the graph pretty much overnight. Um, really? Yeah, dude. What a what a stud, man. Yeah, no kidding. I'm, like, trying, dude, was... I'm trying to pull it up right now. It's close. Okay. Are yeah, you, you do your are thing. You on the, are you on the YouTube channel? If you're on the YouTube channel, you'd be able to see it right now. 
No, I'm not on it. Well, get yep. on the YouTube channel. What the heck, man? So it's kind I, don't, of, I don't watch that garbage. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm showing it though. So if you see the shape of the pattern, it's 39 feet, and it is dead flat. This thing doesn't have any shape on it at all. And we're bowling on, so we're bowling at Concord Lanes, and it's Wood Lanes, right? It is Wood Lanes. Uh, the last time they were cut was two years ago. Um, but they still are in great shape. Like we bowled the house shot tournament this past weekend and they, they still held up relatively well for the amount of uh, high end bowling balls that have been going down the lane. Really? Oh, I see Flanagan posted that Holloman's been good for three plus years. Yeah. He's been awesome. Oh dude. I have no doubts. I just was in a hole for a while there. I was, I didn't bowl competitively for a long time. Oh, and EJ and Natalie, Mike's Mike's on his game, man. He yeah, knows the no, whole world. Yeah, EJ and Natalie are engaged, and the EJ and they both live in Indianapolis. So I'm sure EJ is just like, yeah, I'll go see the family, Natalie's family, for a weekend and hang out there. That's pretty cool that he's supporting the event. I think the event's amazing, man. I think it could be something really, really good. Like I like I I, I explained to you before. I think one thing that bowling misses is being able to capture every moment, and the fact that you only have 20 guys means you can. So. Hey, and Cameron Weir's in the the chat, and he says, "Hey, layout looks great. Thanks, man. Th- actually, yeah, it does give look good. all the credit to Ricky Matsko. This is pretty cool." So, right, um, and then uh, Mike made another uh, comment about, "Yeah, sorry for the delay. We're getting to the messages a little late, but um, twenty seven mils. Yeah, it is going to hook more. Um, I actually considered going even really low, almost down to like nineteen mils to force it to being a urethane competition." But uh, smarter minds prevailed, thankfully. Um, no, I expect 27 mils will still hook a decent amount. So is, but, go ahead. Oh, I said, but the difference is, is that with only being allowed to use two bowling balls and not being allowed to practice on the practice pairs, they're not, there's not going to be an option to burn the pattern in. So, yes, it is going to hook more, but... No, I, I, me personally, I don't know what people are going to choose for equipment. Uh, I could be completely wrong here, but I would not want to go with a big asymmetrical ball, especially on something flat. Um, I, I'm personally, I would want to go for something with definitely low diff, um, medium, maybe a medium strong cover stock, um, and then a strong low diff cover stock. I, I really don't know. I, uh, it would be fun to see how it's going to play out, but I know I really have no idea. Um, how it, I mean, I, I really don't have any idea how any pattern is going to play before I go into it, but this is going to be, this is going to be really interesting because for one, it's a really high buy-in, like the entry fee is really high. Right. So I think because of that, people are going to take it really seriously or at oh. least like the, so what happens in bowling tournaments when you, when you bowl tournaments every single weekend is you see the same guys and become friends with them and you show up and you, you kind of mingle and you bull crap with them and then you, you bowl practice session. And oftentimes it's like, it's not very serious. A lot of guys don't even show up to practice session and cause they, they've bowled on so many patterns and tournaments that they all, they have an idea of how to play pretty much anything. So it's always like this, like relaxed atmosphere, but this, I don't think it's going to be when we show up that that evening i think it's going to be pretty serious simply because the the buy-in the thousand dollars like there's either so at and what i think is a a, it's a good investment bowler wise is because the worst absolute worst you can do is lose a thousand bucks now um all you have to do is have one good game you can have 140s 940s you have 1278 uh and you're breaking even so it's a uh, it's a whole different mentality. It's a whole different atmosphere. I think it's going to be really interesting. I, I I hope I hope people enjoy it. I hope people show up to watch. I think it's going to be amazing. If you're in the St. Louis area this weekend, go to Concord Lanes nine o'clock Friday night, man. It's going to be fun. Well, yeah, oh, it's definitely going to be fun. And then the, I also think there's another dynamic that goes along with it. I think there's some of these bowlers that are in the event who are trying to prove a point almost. Uh, cause you have the guys, so you're bowling professionally all the time. Kyle's bowling professionally all the time. EJ is of course bowling professionally all the time. I, I don't know. I know Gene is on tour, but I don't know if he's constantly bowling professionally. Um, Tim and Shay, I would say classify them maybe a semi-professional. They, they bowl for a lot of money every weekend. Um, really good. But then you've got guys like, and I know Chris Aldridge, 
who is just looking for a chance to go out there and prove himself. He just got on storm staff. He's just, you know, he's wanting to dive in there. Same thing with his buddy, brother Cody. Um, I know you got Bruce Franks who he's just a competitor at heart and is just pumped about going out and competing against the best. Does he, does he bowl much right now? Uh, yeah, he bowls, he bowls a decent amount. And he's throwing a ball actually pretty good. Um, I remember when he first really started bowling, he was just kind of getting back into it, but I bowled uh, Ozarks with him one year in doubles. But, uh, but he's, I mean, being it the way it is, he's just a strong mental competitor. Oh, 100%. So, you know, I don't, I don't know if how he's going to hold up over the course of 10 games, but I wouldn't count him out just, you know, through straight willpower, getting a chance at first, second place a couple of games just because of the type of competitor he is. Same thing with any of these guys. Um, you know, people are going to have their favorites of who they think are going to really, really do well. But with, you know, I bowled collegially with you, Brad. I bowled collegially with Kyle. Like, there's just killer instincts in all of you guys that it's going to be fun to watch because you're going to have a divide. You're going to have the crowd, which is really what I want the event to benefit the most. You know, I want to provide an event where it's more not, it's not that the bowlers aren't important, but the spectators, we're trying to build bowling into something that's more spectator friendly, kind of like the PBA league has, which has done a phenomenal job with, with making that possible. But with, with this, you know, I'm going to have a closed doors conversation with the bowlers beforehand about the way the environment's going to be uh, with the crowd and to expect certain things and, you know, we're there to to compete and to not hold back at all. You know, I'm not going to slap somebody on the wrist for dropping the F-bomb. Now, I want them to respect themselves and respect everybody, but, like, I, I think it's totally okay to go out there and show your emotion. You know, when you watch basketball games, some of the, you know, what do people love about ESPN highlights? You know, they, they love the emotional reactions of basketball players and football players and soccer players and baseball players. Like, those are some of the most watched things when you watch – When's the, the last thing that got on to ESPN's top 10 now is the not top 10, but was Pete Weber's reaction on the U S open oh, people yeah. loved it. You know, loved that's it. the kind of stuff that's, that's worth watching. Uh, you know, Tiger Woods fist pumps when he drains a, a, a 30 foot, 40 foot putt, you know, those are, you know, awesome moments to catch. And Ricky Masco who helped set this up with Brad is going to be the one. And he's going to be really, really good about catching all of that stuff on uh on video which is going to be amazing um yeah that's one thing i wanted to talk about too was it's going to be live on twitch did did you get that idea from ricky did he say it should be a good idea and then you just went along with it i am totally writing everything ricky when it comes to tech um i came over there it was more or less we're sitting there one night and we're just talking about it and i said you know what forget it let's just do it and i just started going at it and anything technically speaking when it comes to the live stream or anything like he would ask me for my input and I'm like, dude, you know what you're doing way better than I, you can go online. There's a video of a <clears throat> Midwest. I forget what he called it, but Ricky has some old vote uh, videos of when he put on tournaments as a, a, a young kid, like I think 19 or 20 and the video quality with the equipment that they had at the time was still phenomenal. He had pen deck cams and multiple view angles for the cameras i lost to a 12 year old kid i was like 18 <laughs> i did it was hilarious um but the quality is so good and it's only i mean it's only gotten better and not only that but he's so meticulous and so good at what he does like he and he cares so much about it like he just doesn't let things fall through the crack um he's just he's just really really good at it simple as that and this is this is the first time anything's been on twitch and I know there, I know there's been a big conversation about Twitch. I had a phone call. I was very fortunate enough to have a phone call with Chad Murphy like a year ago, and I wanted and I wanted to talk to him about the U.S. Open. And then we ended up having like a, a an hour long conversation, and it was really eye opening to me. And he he mentioned that they were putting a lot of research into um, esports and figuring out if there's a way to broadcast bowling on Twitch and you know just just going through. Uh, all the options, you know, just being doing the doing his job, you know, making sure he's putting out the best in, output he can, and and he was really keen to to trying it or doing it. It's huge and it's massive, man. Esports is like insane. Twitch, the the station Twitch, uh, or the platform Twitch is is huge. 
it's it's very big <laughs> and so it's going to be cool it's going to be cool because this is the first one this is the first one that's going to be broadcasted on it yeah i mean i had it's funny i had never heard of twitch yeah prior, exactly. to, <laughs> prior to ricky because yeah it was an esports thing but he when he mentioned that i found out there was a guy just from playing online i don't maybe what's the i don't what's the new game out um PUBG? What is it? Is that PUBG? Isn't there something called PUBG? I don't know. I don't know. Them, there's darn kids in their games, but he's a millionaire because of the game. Yeah. Um, just from streaming on Twitch. Yes. Like multi millionaire. And um, I guess he's just really witty about the way he plays the games and I guess really, really good at it too. So people sit there and watch the gaming all night long. Yeah, I guess maybe take tips from it. But yeah, he's a millionaire from it. And I just didn't even know that was a thing. And he's like, Oh yeah, dude, the Twitch is this is the this is where it's at. And I was like, well, What happened to YouTube? Like, I thought that was where it was at. Right. Yeah. I think I think Flanning in there for a minute was was pushing YouTube really hard. Like, no, we gotta broadcast on YouTube. We gotta do it on YouTube. I mean, YouTube's massive, man. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But Twitch is its own like different thing. Like you broadcast and then you get tips. Are you guys going to be doing that whole thing? Like you're going to be getting tips and like doing like the actual Twitch thing? Oh, he's all over it, man. He's all over it. Dude, Ricky, yeah. We're doing – he's going to be setting up like off-camera interviews. Um, he's – I've never – he's like a kid in a candy shop. That's pretty I cool think. that you teamed up with him. Did you go to him or did he come to you? I think I already asked this question. Well, we were sitting a yelling distance from each other and at our desks – so bowling was nine times out of 10, the most common topic. And, uh, it's just, we've been bouncing it back and forth. And when we have, uh, Billy Locke who sits up like, you know, he's like three desks away and he is like one of the more excitable people I know and loves to put his input on bowling and has a lot of great insight on it. And he's fed a lot into this too, about different ideas. And I know that's probably where a lot of the, a lot of the good ideas come from is when him, and Billy are talking because they have a lot of good ideas that go back and forth from each other. Right. Yeah. I won't take any credit for the streaming stuff because that's just not my thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, in order to, it's nearly impossible to put something together that's successful without some kind of help. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have help just like this. Like we're broadcasting live on YouTube. I would not be able to do this without Ricky. (laughs) I mean, maybe like next (laughs) week I'd be able to, but I, I needed to learn from somebody. So, yeah, dude, I did. I think it's, I think it's gonna be sick, man. I really hope. I think, I think we need to put together a YouTube channel as well, and broadcast each game on YouTube. I think. That would well, be. and and I was gonna ask you guys about that. What your guys' plan was? I haven't talked to you guys about it. I didn't know if you guys were gonna just take video throughout, or if you guys were gonna go live. You're breaking up. No. So we basically catch videos. Can, can, can you hear me now? Are you there? Okay, we're good. Yeah, I'm here. So what are what are Colin and I gonna do? We don't know. We're golden pony boy. Do you want us to vlog? Yeah, and that was. Well, I want you guys to do what you guys want to do. You guys can, like I said, I want this to be 100% spontaneous. Uh, I don't want there to be anything scripted. I want I want just fun. So if you guys want to put on a, a selfie stick and go up there and try to throw your shot, it might ruin your game, cost you a thousand dollars. But totally up to you. Um, or you guys get oh, you guys won't get a GoPro thing. And, I have a uh, GoPro and wear it on your head. Yeah, I do. I have one. Just go up there and nut one for a grand with a GoPro hat on. Wouldn't that be awesome, dude? That's the thing. So this is the thing is. Not every game. There might be a guy that shoots 278 and the next closest is like 240, so he really only needs a mark in the 10th. But there are going to be some like really expensive strikes. Like someone's going to lose $500 because someone struck instead of got nine. Oh, like, there's going to be some expensive chop 610s. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like people are going to go up there and have to pick a bucket or a washout or like just a 36910 for $1,000. Yeah. Like – like the, like I said before, it doesn't matter if you shoot 160. The next game is just important. So I was actually doing. I was thinking about what I was like, how I was going to go into it because the uh, 
you know, I go into you know, a normal eight game block, you have a certain mentality, but this mentality is different. I was actually thinking like, it's going to take a lot of like focus. It's going to take a lot of, uh, determination. It's going to take a lot of patience. I think Flanning and said in the chat that like the last four games, the, the veterans are going to win or take over or have the advantage or something like that, because it can be hard. Like if you go five games in a row and you're not even close to a high game, you know, there's going to be some guys that like take themselves out of it or potentially take oh. themselves out of it or they're lost or they don't exactly know what to do. That's the best part about this pattern is not only you're going to have people strike for a thousand bucks, you're going to have people half to repeat a shot in order to strike for a thousand dollars. And that's a whole different scenario than being able to miss a couple boards. Well, and then also take this into consideration. So, yes, you have all the the accurate the things that come into being accurate and all that stuff too. But when you're out there getting ready to go bowl, you have the game that that matters. Now, this is one criticism I did get because I did change the format in this regard. I added some money to the end, and Eddie Bird made some really, really good comments that I wish he would have been in my ear when I was making the changes. But he said, you're, you were running a, a jackpot style event. And hypothetically speaking, let's just say game three, I lose my look and I want to go try the gutter my last five shots to see what I can do. Now I'm limited on what I can just throw away because I have to worry about an overall payout too. And I was like, you know what? That's a good point. So it went from this being this jackpot thing. But when we had 20 bowlers, I was like, man, but with 20 bowlers, it's, I think it's important to kind of give an overall payout too. So it was like I was stuck in between there, like what I thought was right, what I thought. And I still think I made the right decision, but it did change very drastically how players are going to have to go about their thought process because they're not going to be able to just, you know, no, nope. maybe they start off the front f- or the first five frames with three opens and they're, they, they know they don't have the greatest chance for whatever reason. They can't just go off and just try things like they still have to try to stay close. St- right. You know, if there's a, if there's a 10 pin out there, they can't go throw away the 10 pin to check ball motion because those pins are going to be worth a thousand dollars at the end of the night too. Right. Did you think about so, did, did you think about not making it a thousand for each and making it like three, two, and one? I guess it would be. Well, originally it was just a thousand a game. Originally it was just a thousand for first each game, and then I went to three thousand on top, two thousand, and one thousand. And then when the money got bigger, I was thinking to myself, I didn't want to keep on stacking on the end because that's not where I wanted the focus to be. I wanted the focus to be on the game to game action. So I thought it was important to keep that money there. Right. So paying first and second, I think, I think it was a good idea. And, and if I could, if I could change anything and not lose anybody, if, if it was a guaranteed, I wasn't going to lose anybody from it. I would like to take the 4,000 I have for first, cause I'm paying a thousand dollars for first, second, third and fourth. Um, if I could change anything, I would move that money into the game day game action and I would make first place each game, uh, for $1,400 or make the first place prize even more that way off of one game, you were guaranteed to profit. Right. If I could, if I could do anything, I would probably be what it would be. Do, why do you think, um, people would have a problem with that? Um, just cause I've changed the format. So many times, I guess yeah. twice already. I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to come across as so absent-minded or uh, flaky. I don't know if that'd be the right word. No, so yeah. I wanted, I want to, I want to stick to what we have, especially since now this is what everybody's already agreed to. That's the big thing. You know, being a tournament director is hard because every little tiny thing somebody can. Um, complain about and it's not it's not necessarily because they have ground to complain it's like there are people on this planet that complain just because they can and if they're having a bad day or they have a bad game and they see something not go the exact way that it should say for example you have a bunch of brackets and they don't come out until game three you know, people are going to complain just because they can that there's a chance that you're back there pressing a button until someone you like is making money. Even though that's probably not the not the issue, 
or not the situation at all, someone will do that. So I get where you're coming from because every little thing you do, someone can just take and magnify it and make it a big deal, even though it's really not a big deal. Yeah, I mean, and on top of that, up until, you know, all the money really started rolling in, I think that was another big criticism I got because everybody wanted me to collect the money, like, immediately. When you guys all signed up, they're like, get that money now, like, make sure they lock it in. I'm like, yeah, but I wouldn't be able to put $1,000 three months just put away three thousand dollars that they just have it sit for three months because that's when it started i was like that's a lot of money just to take out of your yeah, account definitely. so i was like these guys are going to be bowling tournaments you know and they're going to need that cash to get into tournaments get their side pots get in their whatever i was like i don't i don't really think it's fair to ask them to do something i wouldn't want to do was jeremy planning on blowing the tournament the whole time or did he like last minute um uh Boyer? Uh Zimmerly. Well, Jeremy Zimmerly won the spot through the sweeper. And so when he won the spot, was he planning on bowling or was he planning on selling it? Well, he was halfway in between on both yeah. decisions. When he it, was he he won it, you know, and I, I don't know what, what his deal is. He's he's so good and he can do something that hardly anybody else I know can do. And he just got this He's got this, like, I don't care attitude, but underlying that he cares a lot. And I think he would do really, really well, potentially, in this. And I, I thought I was excited to see him bowl. A little upset that he's not. Yeah. But I'm super. I'm also very excited to see Ryan bowl. I think this is going to be a good opportunity. Because um, I mentioned this to Ricky. I was like, you know, there's some bowlers. Every bowler coming out of this is going to be a smarter, better bowler for sure. But there's going to be some bowlers who go to that next tier because of just the experience of being involved in something like this. I think like a guy like Ryan can have a complete mental positive change from bowling against you guys and seeing how you guys perform and how to handle yourself in different types of situations. Cause he's bowled college, which is a big step up in the first place, but you know how it is when you went out on tour, like it's another, it's oh, another whole gear. Yeah. It's not and, even like really a gear you can prepare for. It's almost like if you're not crushing everyone in college, you're not ready for the tour. Like you have to be like elite. And there's only like a couple guys, like even AJ Johnson was really, really good, but he's just kind of now starting to get it. You know, he's starting to become elite. He, it took him a little while. But I mean, early on he made a, he made a master show, but Marshall was a guy that kind of had some success early. But it's really hard. Like – you're going out there and you're you're taking a learning experience. That's what you're doing. <laughs> I right. Mean, whether you believe it or not, even if you have one good tournament, you know the rest of them probably aren't going to be pretty, just because it's a whole other world. But Ryan Subblefield, he impresses me because he he's worked on his game. I remember when I was bowling at Linwood, he and Ryan Subblefield bowls for Linwood, by the way. He was a when I was bowling for Linwood, he he was a baseball player for his high school team. That's what his main focus was was baseball. And then I think he had to have like Tommy John surgery or something like that, and then he started bowling. And then he decided to bowl for Linwood. And then the next thing I know, I see like he's making all tournament teams, and I'm like, wow, he's actually improved really quickly. Dude, he's he worked really, really hard. He's got a really good touch now too. He does. Yeah. He's got a really good and touch. he's learning he's learning like physical game and, and how to get the ball to do certain things and what's the correct way. And you know, he's learning all the things that you need to learn in order to be good. What what year is he? Is he a junior? Or a senior? Uh, that's a really good question. I honestly don't know. I don't know, but I'm happy he's bowling. I like the fearlessness behind him. You know, not, not a lot of people. A lot of people would say, "Well, I'm not ready," you know, or whatever. But he, absolutely, he, he wants to get in there. You know, you got to get your feet wet. Yeah, that's why I'm so. I mean, I'm looking at the list here again, and we've got a lot of guys who are, you know, they're you wouldn't consider them. When I, when you're putting up a thousand dollars to bowl, you're a professional bowler, whether you have a card or not. Like that's just. That you're putting yourself, that's what you just became by putting up a thousand dollars to bowl, basically, in my opinion. Right. And, uh, it's going to be exciting because, I mean, we, we haven't really dug deep into the Calcutta yet, but there are definitely going to be favorites. And for me, like, I think I would come to this since I don't bowl as much anymore. I feel I would come into this feeling mentally as like the underdog. And it would just, I would just be gritting in the teeth, ready to attack you guys. Now, the, cal <laughs> the Calcutta's were total pins only, right? Yeah, total pins. And I'm considering something. So 
there's going to be that there's going to be the one Calcutta guaranteed for the total payout. So based off of the final finish, right? And so there's going to be that. And I was thinking of trying to figure out something where you could also bid on people for the per game action as well. So, huh? You know, so you could be like EJ Tack at Game Three. Yeah. Well, and I, and the thing is though, someone mentioned possibly just to go. It could go to one of two ways. So you could do it like that game to game, which is going to be a lot of moving parts, a lot of work, um, a lot of confusion. Or I could do um, an overall Calcutta and then a game first five and then a second back five. Um, it just depends on how. Is that something you're going to ask everybody uh, before we start? Well, if I do it, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to say this is the way it's happening. Because I fi- what I found is the more I ask for advice, yeah, the more definitely. it just gets diluted and confused. Um, Shay Bittman gave me some good advice on it this weekend on the Calcutta uh, ideas, and that was really helpful. Um, cool. But, but yeah, I'm excited. I'm super excited for it. Yeah, if you're, if you're just joining us, uh, we're talking about the tournament that's going on this weekend in St. Louis at Concord Lanes. It's Danny's tournament. It's his first tournament. It's called the Midnight Bowler Society Main Event. Why Midnight Bowler Society? Why How'd you come up with that name? Uh, well, did you guys ever watch Are You Afraid of the Dark? Uh, a little. I don't remember much, though. What? Okay. Are You Afraid of the Dark, bro? <laughs> they have all the episodes on, on YouTube, so you need to just sit back and watch. Basically, so same thing. Are You Afraid of the Dark also came from the Dead Poet Society, so with Robin Williams. And so in the Dead Poet Society, um, these kids would meet at midnight in this, like, hidden place, and they would read poetry. Now, uh, that was like back in the 60s and 70s. So it was a little different. <laughs> that was like an edgy thing to do back then, you know. Living that the life. Yeah. And then in the 80s and 90s, uh, when my parents were bowling a lot, and everybody, I guess everybody's parents that are probably right. a, lot, a lot of people's parents, or people who were a little bit older watching the stream that probably remember those days, um, you know, they, the bowling alleys, they had 24 hour bowling centers where people would bowl jackpots till 5 a.m. in the morning. And I just want that to happen. I thought that was a really fun thing to do. Like, it's just something I would want to be a part of, what I would want to do. So I was like, I don't want to compete with people during the day for tournaments. I don't, I don't like bowling during the day for tournaments. I like bowling at night. I like, you know, I grew up bowling nine, well, watching. My, the dad bowl nine pins that didn't start until 10 o'clock at night and would finish two in the morning. Right. Like that was just the environment I grew up in what I liked. So I was like, well, I wonder if everybody else likes this too. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I know what my buddies like to do at 10 o'clock at night and it's pretty similar to bowling. It's yeah. just with a beer in their hand. Dude, I gotta so, say some, uh, some of my favorite memories were in college when that's what we did. Honestly, I'll, like that's how we got better was bowling at, you know, midnight. Cause we would have those, Thursday night practices after league at ten thirty, and then we would bowl jackpots till one thirty two a.m. And that's how we got good, dude. That's how a lot of guys got good. That's how Tyler Vokes got good. That's how pretty much all of us got good. It was we bowled at night, and we bowled right. competitively doing it. Yeah, and then I was like, "There's no one." I mean, I might have to compete against nine pins, but I just make sure I don't overstack them. And this one, I'm actually it's actually helping because the nine pin at Concord. Um, since it's such a small field, we're bowling with the Midnight Bowler Society. Um, I'm not taking any bowlers from them. And the bowlers who get done are going to become spectators for the Midnight Bowler Society. So they're going to hang around and have some beers at the bowling center, yeah. uh, add, add to the sound in the background, and have some fun. It's just going to be a lot of fun. So basically, it was just something that I thought would be fun that I wanted personally. And I was like, if I want it, I can't be the only person who would have fun doing this. Right. Yeah, so Friday night, uh, Concord Lanes, Midnight Bowler Society main event. He's ran a couple uh, pre-qualifies for it. Jimmy's didn't really want a spot and sold it. Uh, but it's a $1,000 entry, and he's paying out the first game $1,000, second game $500. And, uh, yeah, it's basically like a one big old uh, action match. <laughs> it's, I, just, I, I didn't expect to get to 20 people. I just didn't. I thought 12 was going to be like brutally hard to get to. 
Well, I it's new. I think people are interested in it. That show. Well, okay, that shows people are interested. That's a good sign. Well, and that's a scary thing too, because like, what if this is it? You know, what if the hype goes and people are like, oh, I've been there, done that. They don't want to do it next time. So like, I'm like, how how often can I run something like this? And I'm thinking, max, max, maybe in two different markets, two a year, and in the same market, one a year, because I think you're going to get a couple of the same people. Like, you know, there's not a lot of, unfortunately, the the amount of people that are going to want to put a thousand dollars a bowl is very minimal. Even though, like, I don't know how Billy Eisel does it. But with the proprietor's cup, you have the six hundred dollar entry, and I know they're going in there and loading up with the brackets. So oh, yeah. like, I know they're put they're putting up a lot more than a thousand dollars. And I'm like, man, and I think he's worked really, really hard to get it there. Of course, and oh, for sure, like just the amount of work he's put into it, and the fact I've heard I haven't bowled the events, but I've heard how well they're ran. Uh, just everything just seems to run so smoothly, and the fact he guarantees the twenty grand. On oh top yeah, is, dude! Like he 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 works incredibly hard at it. It's really it's cool to see. Dude, it's a daily hustle for him. He doesn't slow down at all. Oh like, no! And there have can't. been days where I'm like just forgetting about it, and then you know you just constant updates. It's hard to stay that diligent. Well, you're also new too, so you you don't exactly know what the vision is, what it can turn into. Uh, what all goes into it, how well it's going to go. You don't know anything. like so. Right. But he's ran it. He's built it. It's building. It's in the process. So he's motivated. He knows he has his foundation. You know, once you get your foundation, you know, say this time you get 20 entries and it goes really smoothly and there's a lot of really positive feedback and the next time you get 25 guys, well, if you see that growing, then you're going to be more motivated to do whatever you can to to continue to grow it. So... Right. I mean, you know, I, I don't know why I do that. Every time I'm segueing from something you say, I say, I mean, even though I'm not really saying anything, I mean, I don't know what I'm saying, <laughs> but it's the salesman in you. I just, yeah, it's like my, it's like my, my transition word. I can't help it. Right. Um, I challenge you to not say, I mean, anymore. I bet you, you dude, say it. I, I've already almost said it twice. I know you have. <laughs> it, it's, already, it's, it's fighting out. It's way out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, man. So, oh man, I used another transition word. But anyways, <laughs> I can't. But anyways, can't talk. I mean, uh, just say your sentence. Yeah. No, what I was gonna say was, was um, the cool cool thing about it is so we're starting at ten. I have an off duty police officer that's going to be there as well, um, just to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Um, there's going to be a lot of money there. There's going to be people drinking, people yeah. getting their emotions going. So there's going to be an off-duty police officer there. Um, and then I'm going to have uh, a few people there that are just there as watchful eyes to make sure everything's going okay. And, of course, you got Dan Beeman, who's the, the proprietor, who is really, really good about keeping things under control. But I, I just I don't know. I, I'm curious to see what the crowd's going to be. I, I've thrown out the number that just from people coming to watch, not including the nine pin, the, the last nine pin had 78 people. Uh, I think that we might retain maybe 25% of that. That'd be great, I think. That stick but around I'm, to watch. The stick around to watch. But I've gone on to say, and it might be more, like maybe not possible, but I, I think that 100 people are going to show up. Oh, that brings up another good point. Uh, at the door, so I don't have it here, but uh, we're charging $5 for people when they come in the door. Um, that $5 is going to be going towards our, uh, not our scholarship foundation, but a scholarship foundation that was started by Jen Helferstay. Um, for the people who don't know Gary Helferstay, he passed away a few years ago. He was a, a very influential person in the St. Louis Bowling family he uh had a lot of friends knew a lot of people pulled a lot of events did a lot of good things and was a really really nice guy yeah yeah super nice guy i don't it's so funny you bowl against him and he's a very intimidating person he doesn't doesn't smile he didn't didn't smile you thought you hated you Dear and then guy. you go sit in the bar with him and and then you go start sit down talking to him he's like the nicest guy you could ever talk to yep uh, but when he but when he passed away jen started this foundation 
uh, where she gives away a thousand dollars of scholarship to two separate one thousand dollar scholarships to a boy and a girl every year, high school student, and she runs a tournament to collect money for that every year. And I was sitting there, I was like, you know, I think it's worth charging people to come view this, but I don't want to, I don't want to make money off that. I want to make sure it goes to something good. So uh, I think it'd be amazing if we could get a hundred, 150 people inside that building to watch the event, you're looking at $750 of money going to that scholarship fund. Uh, and I think that's a really, really, really big deal. Um, I think that's probably one of the most important things about this uh, is the fact that we're going to be able to benefit something so positive. Yeah, well, it kind of it kind of just adds to the tournament as well. Like, right, you know, a lot of the bigger tournaments, just in general, like not necessarily bowling, but in golf, there's always foundations going on, and there's always other things going on, and and a lot essentially. So it just adds value to the tournament. I think it'd be really cool because right now St. Louis doesn't have any big tournaments, right? Flanagan's not running inside bowling. There aren't any regionals. So well, I- uh. The part-time bowler tour, man. Oh, they're, they're the as big. They're get, they draw like 90 people a tournament, and they're on walls up until next year's going to be on sport, but they're getting yeah, I, 70 I, to 100 people every tournament. I'm sorry. I forgot about that, Larry. Uh, but so <laughs> when, I was, when I was growing up, there was a regional every year at my bowling center, and I always dreamed of like – bowling it uh, and because for one there's a lot of really good bowlers that bowl it and for two it's always on a hard pattern it the challenge is really difficult just something about that pba regional was special and i think it was special because it only happened one time a year and and i had to wait all year for the next time and all year for the next time and so uh the anticipation built up a little bit so having something like that in the st louis area that only happens maybe once or twice a year can give maybe a youth bowler like Cody Aldridge or Ryan Stubblefield or, um, you know, some Linwood players or just uh, Andrew Orr for, I guess he's already bowling, but um, I don't know, just some youth bowlers, something to look forward to. Like one event that they grew up watching that they want to be a part of, uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of like holiday doubles. So it, it's just something that's tied into the culture. Now, it would be cool if this became something like that, but when you have tournaments that are tied into the culture of the city, um, holiday doubles, I mean, it went through a period where it was really, really big yeah. in the 90s to early 2000s, and then it, it really struggled there for some time, and now it's blowing up again. Yeah, um, That tournament's but, crazy, man. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. <laughs> it's and so then I, I grew up watching my dad bowl it, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to bowl it. And the first year I was an adult, it was one of the first tournaments I bowled. I, was, I hopped all over it. Yeah, I, I forgot about holiday doubles as well. I'm just I'm just not on the ball with things. I don't know what's going on in St. Louis. <laughs> yeah, you can't Kansas City guy now, man. You're you gave up on us. I know Kyle Sherman came over to Kansas City this past weekend and he won both tournaments and then he goes back to St. Louis. I'm like, dude, just stay over. Don't even don't even come over <laughs> my part of the town anymore. You coming over? You win in my tournaments, then you leave. <laughs> not <in> my house. <laughs> yeah. So I, I told you right before the broadcast that if we start on a topic and just flow, it just goes quick, right? So we've been talking for an hour. I know. I just saw that. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting the desk there. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, doesn't feel like it too. Well, I mean, I think we covered what we wanted to cover, man. I just wanted to talk about this weekend. Um, the Twitch channel. So Ricky Masco is running the, running the whole show on Twitch. The whole, whole nine yards is going to be on Twitch. His Twitch handle is War, Warwick, W-A-R-W-I-C-K. STL. Was that correct? Do you have that written down? Yeah, that sounds exactly that sounds right. Good. Okay, I'll do it. So, W A R W I C K S T L, Warwick, St. Louis, Friday night, 9 p.m. If you're a Twitch guy, subscribe. If you're not a Twitch guy person, download it um, and do your best to support the tournament because this could be, um, this is definitely something different and we don't know the potential of this and I'm really excited. That Danny, you are doing this. What's up? If you have Amazon Prime, you can get a free subscription of Twitch. Really? Just make sure they know that. Yeah. Okay. So. So yeah. So do that. Big deal. So Friday yeah. night. Don't be cheap. Just go do it. Yeah. We start bowling at nine p.m. Right. Start bowling at nine p.m. Five on a pair, four pairs. Which, to be fair, though, in my opinion, that's when the like I mean it was practice, but that's when the bowling starts because you need to be going up there executing shots so you can figure out ball motion 
And you have to be like, if, if I was the guys, I'd have a piece of paper notes of like everything you can possibly think of, because you have to figure out what the best, you know, yet you're going to have to take into account other plays around you too. Like, so you know how it is on tours and you have less of a rev rate than like Kyle and EJ and Shane and Tim. So no, you I already don't. kind of, <laughs> he's like, man, you got a little, you seen the bigger, the Burger King commercial, got those little hands. Yeah, I got those little hands. <laughs> got the little hands. It's all right. I'll play, up, I'll play up two with my no rev, right? <laughs> but uh, you have to have an idea of how you want to go about attacking this because I'm I'm fairly certain what's going to happen, and this is just my speculation. I think that they're going to be very, very tight. People are going to get to the squeeze-in point where even though the pattern is 39 feet, which if you use the whole USB-C rule 31 means your break point should be about seven on flat patterns. That is kind of out the window. It doesn't necessarily mean what's going to happen, but I think the guys who are more comfortable playing in are going to screw the pattern over and force it to play left as right handers. And I, I could, I could see that happening very, very easily where right handers start too deep because that's where they're comfortable playing. Because when you're lost and you don't have a look, you go where you're comfortable. It's just kind of a, a general thing a lot of people do. I think right-handers are going to shoot too far in too early on the pattern and possibly screw themselves. Well, I think that's a high, very strong possibility. I think it's going to depend on pair to pair. So there's going to be four pairs, five on a pair, right? Five pairs, four on a pair. Five pairs, four on a pair. Okay, so and we can practice wherever we want during that hour on any pair? No. You can only practice on your own pair for an hour? No. We have lane one and two off limits for staging for Ricky. Game three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve competition pairs. Thirteen and fourteen. Only one practice pair. Everybody on that pair. There's only one practice pair, twenty guys practicing for an hour. Yeah, I did that on purpose. Why? <laughs> Your torture. I thought it was going to be great. All right. Well. So here's the reason why, actually. It's it's out of necessity. I didn't have an option. So one and two is out of play because we needed that for something else. Um, the nine pin takes up the rest of the house. And I don't have another option. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so nine, that's o- so nine o'clock. So we're all going to bowl on one pair. And then when we're done practicing, we go to the competition pairs. And then we'll, we get like 10 minutes. Just start. You just start. So you start bowling game one on a very fresh pair. Absolutely fresh. No practice. No chance to bring the pattern in. Nothing. First game. First game is going to be interesting. Do you think that gives a disadvantage to the guys that are, are going first? Uh, I think it's going to be a disadvantage. And this is what I was trying to say. I, well, I think that right-handers are going to screw themselves on because they're going to want to play it. They're going to want to play it safe. Yeah. And so they're going to want to keep their angles closed. It, you know, especially not being able to practice on the pair. It, you're going to go up there and most of the guys are good enough to just let it freewheel, but it's going to be hard to let that first ball go. Not really being as lined in as you want to be. Yeah. Well, it's it, so we're if you start off the first game and you're playing like 5 and cuz that's where you got lined up in practice, you saw a couple of guys doing it, so you play 5 and then maybe you shoot 2 10, which is a pretty good game, but it doesn't win you anything. And then you go to the next pair where EJ Tag is playing 15 and he shoots 230 and you go up there and 210 your first shot. What do you do? Do you jump into 15 or do you make bang a ball change or you know, I think that's going to be two balls. You only got two balls. Yeah, that's crazy, man. You're nuts. You're going to drive. That's why, you're gonna drive that's why it's an hour's insane. worth of practice, though. What's that? That's why it's an hour's worth of practice, though, too, because... You can practice with all your balls as many as you want. Anything you want, yeah. You an hour's worth of practice. So the amount of bowlers, I was only going to do 30 minutes, but with the amount of bowlers and the fact that People are going to want to throw different equipment and things like that. But I also think it's important you're going to get to watch your competitors, how they're playing the lanes, and get an idea, read off them. So if you're smart, you're watching everybody else throw shots. You're watching their ball motion. You're watching 
the type of equipment they're throwing, the surfaces they're using, just to get an idea of the whole spectrum of things right. that are going on. Um, and then you have to play within your own game, of course. So you have to stay within yourself. Don't get ca- too caught up on what everybody else is doing, but you should be informed of what everybody else is doing. Yeah, oh, sure. absolutely. So two balls. Wow, this is going to be nuts, man. This is going to be the sickest tournament I've ever bowled, I think. <laughs> uh, well, and it's going to be, and who knows how it's going to play out because you're, we were talking about just being lined up, but let's just say you're lined up and all it takes is a simple ball change for you to go from 190 to 230, but you can't make the ball change. So what do you do now? Right. And then it's back, to, it's back to the good old, let me give an extra quarter turn on the bottom of the swing here. Yeah. Let me do whatever I can do. So it's going to go back to more truer bowling in that regard. It's going to come back to feel. Yeah. You're not going to be able to just, yeah, as simple as that. Go to this magical ball. You got to make make something happen. And that's where it gets hard to make good shots because when you're trying to get the ball to do something that it, you know, just a little bit different than it normally does or you're trying to do something that you're not necessarily comfortable with, right. good luck shooting 230 when they're impossible. Huh. Yeah. Well, I don't feel, I don't, I'm not a, what would be the word? I'm not, I'm a jealous, but I'm not jealous. Of bowling? Yeah, like, it's like more or less, I want to bowl, but it's going to be nice watching you guys suffer. Why'd you decide, why'd you decide to run tournaments? Oh, just because you sat there and talked to your friends while you worked and you wanted to do something that impacted the sport? Well, I also like to, you know, if I'm going to make a career out of bowling, I'm probably not going to do it bowling yeah. i mean hypothetically anything's possible i guess you could say but realistically even the guys who are making a living on tour aren't really making a living on tour right like you're surviving and really grinding it out but what happens you know what happens and i don't mean to dog on anything that any guy on tour is doing but like hypothetically speaking what happens if you broke your wrist tomorrow like what would happen You'd have to, it would be detrimental. And that's what was my big fear is like, what would happen? You know, I go out there, I have five good years on tour. I average maybe 50 to a hundred thousand dollars a year. What happens at sixth year when I start going downhill and seventh year and eighth year, possibly going downhill, you know, what would happen? You know, we're not, I just had all these thoughts going through my head and I was like, if I'm thinking this much already and I haven't even thrown a ball out there yet. Yeah, I probably exactly. I should probably figure something else out, and I thought running tournaments was a possible, and it was it was a it was something that would, I thought would be fun. I, I this is something I wanted to bowl, so it was like it was easy to put it together um, with a little bit of passion too. So well, you run a bad. you run a, a league on Sunday nights during the winter too, right? Like a twelve league sports shot league. I do. Yeah, it's gonna be. Uh, I have to talk to Randy Lightfoot, make sure he's good to go on it. I think he's gonna be okay with it, but probably gonna be moving to Tuesday nights at St. Charles. Okay. Uh, going to be running four, ten, four, probably four, eight week sessions over the course of the winter. So we'll go start like sometime in August, run eight weeks, take the ninth week off, start another eight week session, take the ninth week off, start another eight week session, ninth week off, and then do the same thing. Cool. Um, and then Storm has agreed. Well, Steve, um, Steve Todd's agreed to help me out with two balls per session to raffle off. So it adds. Because the way I do it, I raffle off forty squares and five dollars a piece. So we get two hundred, four hundred bucks out of both those bowling balls to go to the prize fund. Cool. And so prize funds aren't like the greatest thing you'll ever see, but we're doing, you know, with eight week sessions. There's there's not a lot of meat on the bone to really be had. So well, I mean, doing, a lot of the value in that uh, league anyway is the the competition and the challenge of the pattern. Yeah, but I mean. Maybe three percent of the people we're trying to sell that idea to actually understand that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The rest go. How, the rest go. How much is first place? Exactly. What do I get if I shoot three hundred? Where's my ring? <laughs> Screw the USB. What do I get out of this? <laughs> but well, that's what it is. You want to wrap it up? Yeah, probably should. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't. <laughs> okay. Go back to being daddy. Thanks for yeah, uh, daddy time. Thanks for sitting down with me. Hopefully, uh, if oh, you're thanks for asking me. I appreciate it. Yeah, if you're paying attention or watching the video, this Friday, June fifteenth. What's the day? Monday, 12, 13, 14, June fifteenth, nine p.m. on Twitch. Or if you're in the St. Louis area, go to Concord Lanes and Dan Beeman's house. 
man, it's going to be exciting. I'm glad we got to talk about it and promote it a little bit. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for helping me with that. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem, man. I will uh, I'll talk to you soon, all right? Oh, and we still need the last spot filled. So if someone wants to bowl, oh, yeah. uh, we got we got a few buyers already. They're trying to get the backing for it. But if someone wants to bowl, let me know. Okay. All right, man. Right. See ya. Peace.